Relationship regulation theory is a theory of moral psychology, stemming from relational models theory, that says that the motives, reasons, norms, principles that attach to various human relationships depend upon the model we use for those relationships. They fall into four basic kinds. There are communal sharing relationships, authority ranking relationships, equality matching relationships, and market pricing relationships. Let's talk about the norms that are associated with equality matching relationships. They are basically peer-to-peer -peer relationships, the kinds of relationships you find, for example, among siblings in a family or among cousins, the kind of relationship you find among people at the same level in any organization, in any hierarchy. It's the kind of relationship that you find among friends, where nobody is above, nobody is below, but on the other hand, it's not like everything is held in common and everything is fully shared either. It's a matter of people dealing with one another on the basis of equality. Equality matching relationships are different from communal sharing relationships because people do keep track of who's contributing what and who's receiving what. In a communal sharing relationship, nobody's keeping track. People simply share. They view everything as collective, as jointly owned. What's good is good for the group. Everybody shares in that. On the other hand, any responsibility is the group's responsibility. Not so in an equality matching relationship. Their individual people have individual responsibilities. They have individual ownership of goods. But there is a concern for keeping those in balance, for keeping those at some degree of an equal level. So friends, for example, may participate in a carpool or may share the workload at a certain level of the company. There's a concern that people are putting in equal effort, that they receive roughly equal salaries. And indeed, people in this kind of equality matching relationship can find inequalities like this extremely uncomfortable. When I first joined the university where I teach, for example, the other junior faculty members, the people who were at the same level in the hierarchy as me, and therefore with whom I had an equality matching relationship in theory, were very upset that I came in at a salary that was almost exactly their salary. They did not like that one bit, and they wrote a letter to the entire faculty, including me, complaining about the fact that my salary wasn't lower. Well, as you can imagine, that made me feel very warmly toward my peers, um, all of whom were fired later, by the way. I was not terribly sad about that. But the point is this. People who feel as if they're in this kind of equality matching relationship are strongly committed to maintaining the equality. And indeed, there is here a strong motive, which is equality, which is balance, maintaining an even balance among the goods and the responsibilities attached to each person in that equality matching relationship. So if the central norm attached to equality matching is equality, reciprocity, people being pretty much at the same level, and goods and responsibilities being balanced, then there's a strong drive to eliminate any imbalances, to push things back. If somebody's getting less, then to give them more. If somebody's getting more, then to reduce that, to give them less. But conversely, in responsibilities, if somebody is carrying too much of the burden, well, to help them out and to relieve that burden. If somebody's carrying too little, well, to get them to carry more. This kind of equality matching relationship is important, and you can see here how there are subtle differences between the various kinds of relationships, and in any particular relationship, differences in the way people might think about the nature of the relationship. So within a marriage, for example, some things may be fully shared. Maybe husband and wife fully share the bank account, for example. There is not his money, her money, or anything like that. There is instead simply our money. But it might be that other things are carefully divided and people have equal shares. There's a bottle of wine. Ah, now there's a concern that each person get an equal amount. Or, hey, within any relationship, there will be concerns like that. Since people in an equality matching relationship do value equality, 
they're going to be concerned with equal goods, equal responsibilities. Now, of course, some goods and some responsibilities really can't be divided up in this way. So what do you do in that sort of case? There are all sorts of goods, even within a company, that can't really be divided up. Who is going to be the lead on this particular project, for example? Well, to say lead already suggests the kind of authority ranking relationship. But maybe it's just that this group of people, all of whom are at the same level, have different tasks, different responsibilities. Sometimes groups are assigned to a particular project. One person has to organize the group, and so one person is designated as that organizer for the group. Well, that puts them in some position of leadership, yes, but it's still primarily an equality matching relationship. Now, there's a concern to distribute those things evenly, but after all, in this sort of case, well, yeah, it's one thing, right? Organizing that. So what do we do in those cases? There's a concern for, well, first of all, if it's not the kind of thing that can be divided, at least an equal chance at it. Think about a lottery, for example. The prize money is not something we simply distribute evenly among all those who buy a ticket to the lottery, but instead each person has to have an equal chance. If we find out that it's rigged and some people have a gr much greater than equal chance, that's a problem and it violates the terms of the equality matching relationship. Sometimes, as with group leadership and organizing within this sort of group about a particular project, it may be that people take turns. Well, you organize that project, I'll organize this one. Or you're doing that one already, so we'll let so-and-so do this one. There's an attempt to take turns, to determine things by chance if there's no other way of doing it. In an equality matching relationship, People are concerned with an even balance, so if one person does another a favor, that person generally feels responsible to repay the favor, to give that person a favor, and so on. In a communal sharing relationship, that's not really true. The parents, for example, are constantly doing favors for the children, getting them food, taking care of various things for them. There's no sense that the child now owes the parent a lot in return. But if it's among friends, there is that sense. If I drive, for example, to work, well, then there's some sense that you may owe me the favor of giving me a ride to work in exchange, even if it's not a formal carpool. And if it is a carpool, by the way, where we've got equality matching, there's a sense that, well, we take turns driving in roughly equal proportions. Now, if there is no concern for that, if it's friends, it's like, hey, you, you live further away, I live a little closer, will you just mind picking me up and taking me home? Well, that may well happen. And in that case, maybe the friend feels responsible for repaying the favor in some other way. If so, that's an equality matching relationship. But maybe they don't. Maybe both of them are fine with this arrangement. Then it's more like a communal sharing relationship where they're simply sharing the burden in the way that makes the most sense. What about decision making? In a communal sharing relationship, the ideal is consensus. Everybody participates and tries to come up with a collective decision. In an authority ranking relationship, it's really the job of the person in the superior position to make the decision, or at least to delegate it to someone in the lower position. In an equality matching relationship, everybody equally participates in making the decision. And so this corresponds to something like everybody having a voice, a one man, one vote type of system where people do things democratically. And so you could see democracy as an attempt to write large in society as a whole, something like an equality matching relationship. Political ideals of equality also seem to be extrapolating from equality matching relationships to the entire political organization, to the entire polis. And another way of looking at this is to say that Rawls's veil of ignorance is something like this. The parties to the original position must be equal. They all have an equal say in determining the rules under which they will live. In extended interactions, an equality matching relationship tends to be associated with a sort of tit-for-tat strategy. I do something for you, you do something for me. Conversely, I do something to you, you do something to me. So this can have a good side. It can lead to patterns of mutual cooperation, but of course it can also lead to patterns of mutual retaliation. And in game theory, that strategy of tit-for-tat, though it's generally uh, one of the best, if not the best, strategy for extended 
interactions in prisoners' dilemmas, stag hunts, and other kinds of complex interactions. Nevertheless, it does have a downside. Retaliation can lead to a cycle of retaliations where people continually defect, and so it can be hard to re-establish cooperation. The same thing can happen in an equality matching relationship. We strive for equal balance, but if something throws that equality enough out of balance, and people don't actually try to get back into balance, it can destroy the nature of the entire relationship. One last potential negative implication of equality matching relationships. People are concerned with equality, and so any perceived inequality can lead to resentment. It can lead to the eventual breakdown of the relationship. That can make it hard for people at different levels in a company to remain friends, for example, or for people at very different degrees of wealth or education or other signs of social status to remain friends. It can become a problem in a friendship. And that kind of thing can also become a problem even in a family where people at the same level find it hard to relate to one another. Let's say one brother becomes much more affluent than the other brother, or that sister ends up being in a position much higher in the social hierarchy than that other sister. Those can generate real problems within families as well as within friendships. They can lead to resentment, they can lead to envy. Also, this kind of consideration can lead to people hiding their status, hiding their wealth, hiding their social position, because it generates such problems. Now, in some ways, you might say that's a good thing, but in other respects, it can be a problem. Think about what's happened in the United States with dress, for example. Over time, patterns of dress have changed tremendously. Look at photographs of the United States in the 1950s, for example, and you're struck immediately by several things. One is that people were much better dressed than in general. Both today and then, actually, people tended to dress in ways that were more or less equal when they were in public around people of different social statuses. When people were in public, when people were traveling, when they were around people of various social positions, actually then they all dressed up. All the men were in suits and ties. All the women were in dresses. And so everybody, if you will, in public settings then dressed up. <laughs> Now they tend to dress down, which is an interesting change. But in both contexts, there's an attempt to eliminate social differences by hiding the various positions of people in a hierarchy, reducing the possibility of resentment, but also increasing the chances for productive equality matching relationships.